Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 113, The King, the Lawyer, and the Foundling. In 1376, Edward III had died. The man most responsible for creating and carrying on the Hundred Years' War was now dead. Five years after his son, the Black Prince had also passed away because of dysentery. The monarchy was then placed into the unprepared hands of Richard, a child. Now, a lot of people have a lot to say about Richard II, but this podcast and myself are not really prepared to say a whole lot. But you do have to understand the context of how the Gwyndir Revolt began and what the germination of all of it was. Richard was crowned king at the grand total age of 10 years old. He was, of course, at that age, not prepared for the task that was now placed before him. The young king was led by a series of counselors who were mostly determined to keep the crown away from Richard's powerful uncle, John of Gaunt. Owen Glyndwr was born, we think, somewhere between 1349 and 1359. I myself and some of the scholars I've looked at would lean to the later date due to how long it would have taken him to get married, to have a career, and in the end to carry out his revolt. You wouldn't expect somebody in their 60s to be in the midst of a revolt and to have lived long enough to really accomplish that. You know, a lot of people were dying in their 50s and 60s at that era, so likelihood is he's going to lean closer to 1359. Um, his father, Griffith Feichan, was the lord of Gwyndaverdoy and Queenleith, which were in the Dee Valley, uh, relatively close to the border areas, and lay in an area which was the hereditary home of Powys Fedog, or North Powys, the old kingdom which had once existed, at least until the end of independence. It was taken or given to his great-great-grandfather, Madog, who had acquired them at the end or near the end of the independence. And it gave them a very large income at the time of around 300 marks. But never let it be said that the Welsh lords had it easy. Madog's son, Owain's grandfather, Griffith ap Madog, lost his inheritance for a time due to the machinations of a local marcher lord, Mortimer, the Mortimers were long allies and enemies of various Welsh kings and lords, so this was pretty typical at the time. But nonetheless, it took kingly intervention to return the lands to Griffith, which would be a boon to his son, Griffith Feichan. Feichan, in effect, meaning could be called junior, but also means lesser, smaller, that kind of idea. Basically, that's the concept. Uh, Griffith was married to Ellen, who was said to be the daughter of a lord of Coeth, known as Thomas Ap Llewellyn, who had ancestry into the old Duith Barth lines. Now, bards, poets, and the like have added a few legendary aspects to all of this. Uh, in various legends that grew around these various lords and ladies linked to Owain, uh, in one case it was said that one of the descendants of Llewellyn the last, through an unknown daughter named Catherine, had basically been a progenitor for Owain, which logically makes no sense. But there was something of a cottage industry for descendancy through Welsh nobility in the late Middle Ages, in part because there was no evidence left due to the untimely demise of various dynasties. By this point, the senior and most well-known line of the kingdom of Gwyneth had passed away and had ceased to exist, but that didn't stop people from claiming lineage from it. Uh, in fact, as I said, this is in part because there is no evidence to show or point back to actual records. But if you're, you know, in the case of my family and, and specifically my wife's side of the family, she has a line of noble houses which pass through Wales via a much non-childbearing daughter of Llewellyn. Uh, this same line also claims descendancy from Thor and Odin, so you can understand that the um, things get a little sketchy, let's put it that way. And it also shows the limits of genealogy when nobility get involved. 
if you're doing family history, if that's something you're interested in, word to the wise, once you get past about 1500, if you get to 1500, you're pretty much on guesswork at that point. But if you're a bard, a prophet, or a poet, the idea of a perfect man, an inheritor of all of the ancient lines of Wales, must have seemed rather brilliant. It would also serve later for the Tudor purposes <clears throat> when Henry VII brought himself forward as a combination of Norman, English, and Welsh nobility with connections again to all the ancient lines in Wales and an appeal to Arthurian legend to go along with it. Owen, as I said earlier, was likely born around 1359. His father died sometime before Owen was 11. This meant that Owen was not raised at home, but was brought under the guardianship of a noble Anglo-Welsh descent by the name of Sir David Hamner. Hamner was a lawyer in the court of King Edward III at that point in time. His family had been English lords who married into Welsh noble families and had lived in the northern marches near Wrexham. Hamner Village was one of the places which they inherited, and John of Upton one of the sons of the first person, the first Anglo-Norman lord that moved there, uh, would game Hamner at the death of his father and eventually would become, or at least the family would become known by the surname. John married Hawes Fair Einion, one of the descendants of the English loyalist uh, Griffith Ap Gwenwinwin. She was linked to Owen's family as well, so... Thus, David had links into Owen's line that would make them easy allies, as you can imagine. David married Angharad ver Llewellyn Duth ap Griffith. They would be linked to the Tudor line through their son, Griffith, who married Gwerfil Ferch Tudor, the head of the Tudor line. Owain was heavily influenced in his time with David, both in education and in matters even more personal. In this case, Owen would marry David and Angharad's daughter, Margaret, later in his life, meaning that much of his personal connections would link him back to a place that, for him at least, seemed to create so many memories and so much in the way of familial connections. Hamner was appointed sergeant of law in Richard's court and rose to prominence as the king's sergeant, uh, which was a legal advisor to Richard II. This meant that he was one of the few lawyers who could advocate at the highest levels. This was not some backwater bit player who was considered a second-class citizen. He was a powerful member of the aristocracy and thus well-placed to help his young charge join him in the legal profession and connect him with some very powerful people. By 1383, Hamner was appointed Justice of the King's Bench and was considered to be the top lawyer in the land. Hamner had served in that position as a trier of petitions in the House of Lords, which is a very exclusive position. You don't just get that just by being a lawyer. And by 1387, was in such a trusted position that he was knighted by Richard, thus the Sir David. However, a year later, David was dead, and we're not given any information as to how he died. But we know that in 1388, his widow, Angharad, was managing his estate, and later her son-in-law, Owain, was working as a trustee for the estate. So to put this in perspective, it means that Owain was not raised as a Welsh rebel. He was not raised to be a figure of prophecy or someone looking to establish a new order. Had Richard survived... Henry Bolingbroke, it may have been likely that he would have joined his father-in-law on a successful career in the legal profession, and maybe would have required the wealth needed to become an important member of the court. Or, conversely, he may have had connections with Bolingbroke, which we'll talk a little bit about, which may have helped him as well. As Owen was growing in stature and importance in his local life and in his work experience, he, he being King Richard, had emerged from the early challenges to his rule, and in 1381, two years before Hamner was appointed to the king's court, Richard, as a youth, confronted the peasants' revolt. Richard was 14 at the time and still seemingly led by older men, but was fully involved in the handling of this revolt, one that did not end well for said peasants, needless to say, and also set in 
tone his belief in himself and his abilities as a shrewd negotiator and someone who could cross other people with, well, one could say small consequence at the time. In 1386, the young king, now a married adult, had to deal with French threats of invasion and a parliament which would not allow the government to continue to raise taxes to fight the wars of his father and grandfather. The threats to interfere with the management of the king's finances from these nobles became an issue of contention between both sides. It was, in fact, during the 1387 uh, parliament that they began to argue further while looking for allies amongst the nobility. Hi, I'm Nikesh Raghani, commentator and host of the India on 99.94 podcast. Several times each week, my co-host Sara Waris and I will be bringing you the very best in Indian cricket chat. Whether we're discussing the legend of Julan Goswami, KL Rahul's strike rate, the men's T20 death bowling woes, or the latest controversy involving the BCCI, we've got you covered. You can listen and subscribe via your usual podcast provider. Just search for India on 99.94. You can watch us via YouTube and you can download the 99.94 app. If you love Indian cricket, then join our our conversation. Hello everyone, my name is Tom Kearns and I host the Anglo-Saxon England podcast, where I cover the history and culture of England from the departure of the Romans in the 5th century to the Norman Conquest in 1066. So far we've surveyed the collapse of Roman rule in Britain, the migration of the Anglo-Saxons, and the history of Northumbria from its beginnings in the mists of legend to its destruction at the hands of Viking raiders in the 9th century. I hope you'll come and give it a go. because of these problems, the king may have at that time knighted Hamner in part because he was a friend and a loyalist, and the king was looking for ways to mitigate the parliament by appointing people in charge that he had reasonable belief in. Richard considered the parliament's demands basically to be treason and wanted to prosecute them for it. In 1388, the parliament won the political fight, and Richard had to back down, seeing some of his allies exiled while others were put on trial and other loyal knights were executed. This is why we don't know how or why Hamner died. He may have died at this point because of this intervention. He may have been one of those who may have been exiled. Or we, There's so many things that could have happened, but unfortunately we just don't know. So we just don't know what happens. We just know he passed away. He was an older gentleman at this point in his 50s or 60s, even at this point. So we don't really functionally know kind of where he was at. Either way, because of that, we'll accept maybe he passed away from, you know, age rather than the mutiny in effect. Um, much like his ancestors, Henry and Edward, Richard was never going to allow the lords to dictate to him forever. By 1389, Richard, now 21, took full command as king and was able to negotiate a peace with the French over some years, which would then give him some breathing space to deal with the parliament. During these intervening years, Richard had to deal with the Scottish invasion of the north, one we'll speak a little bit about later, and the death of his wife. In 1396, after many years of negotiations, Richard agreed to a truce with France, that was the best he could get, and took a very young daughter of Charles VI of France as his wife. She was all of six years old, Richard being 29. The match was not, needless to say, made for anything other than political reasons. And because Richard had really loved his wife Anne, who had died only a couple of years earlier from the plague, one must wonder if that played on him a little bit and whether this political wedding was more an advisor's suggestion rather than his desire, or possibly the only way the French would actually submit to the idea of a truce. In 1394 to 1395, at the pleading of the Anglo-Norman lords, the English armies returned to Ireland and forced the native chiefs to submit to the crown. Richard, on that occasion, after successes in France and in, then, of course, in Ireland, it probably had him feeling that it was now time to take his vengeance out on those who had made his life miserable just 10 years earlier. 
In Shrewsbury in 1398, 10 years after the Parliament, which had opposed its will in the king, Richard returned the favor and freed himself from those restrictions. Parliament was sidelined, and Richard would rule with unfettered power, but it is a power that would not last long. Owain also had an eventful few years during this period. In 1380, Owain was sent to London to study law at Inns of Court. During this period, this was the preeminent school for legal profession in England, and thus an important step in the foundation of a career, and also, of course, the place where you make important contacts. In effect, it was Owen's version of Eton, the famous private school in Britain that is responsible for 19 prime ministers. It is suggested that Owen studied legal as a legal apprentice for seven years in London, honing his education and likely preparing his professional standing. In 1383, after some years in London, he returned to Hamner and married Margaret, becoming the squire of, of Sincharth and Glyndoverdoy, which, of course, gives him his famous uh, surname of Glyndur. In 1384, he was now in the service to the crown, not in a legal profession, but as a military one, serving on garrison duty under Gregory Sace. Sace was an old hand in the military, fighting in France, Spain, and Brittany. He was appointed to Berwick-on-Tweed in part because of how successful he'd been in military affairs. Say was one of only three Welshmen at that point who had actually been knighted. This included Hamner, Sice, and Huel ap Griffith, better known as Huel the Blood Axe. Owain served in Scotland from 1385 and to possibly 1386, as possibly a squire to the Earl of Arundel. However, he would return south as part of his legal profession, giving evidence at the Scropes v. Grosvenor trial. So we know he spent some time, at least in 1386, in the south near his home. This particular case is a very strange one, one of the longest in history. Apparently it took five years to make a decision on it, which was a conflict over two nobles because they both had the same heraldry. And this was realized actually while on campaign in Scotland when they saw each other's banners and realized this particular problem. So then they went to court to decide who actually won this case and became the one who owned the particular coat of arms, which is a very interesting and odd thing to debate about. While we have no idea how long Owain spent in Chester with his case, he did eventually make his way back into the service of Arendelle, uh, as he was mustered in March 13th of 1387 to serve as Esquire along with his brothers and cousins for an attack on France, which was scheduled to happen in 1388. However, it was the interesting battle of Radicut Bridge, which was the fight that he ended up becoming belong involved in. It was a fight between loyal forces to the king and forces loyal to the parliament. Some of the members of parliament, I should say, and those particular members being led by the king's cousin, Henry Bolingbroke. Glyndor and his famous rival would share the battlefield for the first and possibly only time as allies. The battle was mostly a small skirmish. Only a few people died, but those loyal to Richard lost the battle. Erendel, under the command of Henry Bolingbroke, the future Henry IV, helped to win the battle for him. In the end of 1387, with the death of his father-in-law, Glyndor retired to become the trustee of the estate. His connections started to run afoul of the king. Arundel, one of the earls he was most affiliated with, was executed in 1397. Sace, his military commander, died in 1390. And, of course, his father-in-law had passed away in the years prior to that. Glyndor now found himself with few connections outside of his immediate and extended family and with few abilities to continue to make connections. Many minor nobles for the next few hundred years would rise and fall from prominence as Hamner's family had done over the last century or so. There was nothing really from his career or his life choices that showed that Owen was a man who would lead a major revolt. 
and the last real hope for Welsh independence. He was as embedded with the English as he could be for someone in his position, and his service and connections may have served him well under Henry IV under the circumstances. As we just noted, he'd fought with Henry IV in the battle against the king, but had also been affiliated with someone who was a loyal servant to the king. So it's a confusing milieu of how and why this all sort of broke down for him. Largely, he'd sat out the later troubles of Richard and was placed in a position to be a small noble with a large family who'd acquired wealth enough to be comfortable, while those around him, his fellow Welshmen, on the other hand, were rising against the English, were leading revolts, and effectively had become tired of being, in their thoughts and feelings, beaten down and were waiting for someone to come along who could be that new Arthur, that new Ambrosius, the new head of his people. Little did they know that this little often regarded lord was going to become so significant to all those parties. And with that, we're going to end here. So if you'd like to contact me, reach out to me, or in any other way, get a hold of me, you can do so at the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com. You can also visit us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. And you can also uh, reach out to me on Twitter at Welsh History Pod. I try and respond back on all those categories as quickly as I can. Sometimes I'm better than others, depending on situations and work. But uh, thank you all for listening. And uh, thank you once again for those who are members of my Patreon community. You guys are the reason why I'm able to do this podcast, because you help fund the books and other things that I have in order to make this work and flow. And with that, thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a great day. Bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. And for everything we do, check out distractionsmedia.com. Hello, everyone. My name is Tom Kearns, and I host the Anglo-Saxon England podcast, where I cover the history and culture of England from the departure of the Romans in the 5th century to the Norman Conquest in 1066. So far, we've surveyed the collapse of Roman rule in Britain, the migration of the Anglo-Saxons, and the history of Northumbria from its beginnings in the mists of legend to its destruction at the hands of Viking raiders in the 9th century. I hope you'll come and give it a go.